we continue our study of John, you know, Jesus was well aware that the opposition was waiting for him. His boldness is increasing. So the boldness of Jesus had gathered and lost a large number of followers. It's difficult to imagine. You know, when you, you, you see a number of people, and it, especially your disciples, see a number of people, and then suddenly you lost them. Uh, you know, it made me think of uh, uh, someone who would come out of this church as a teen, went out to be a pastor, and we talked one day when we were visiting, and he said one of the most discouraging things for his church was winter, because he was way up in the UP in paradise, and he said, in the summer, we'll get 95, 100 people. And in the winter, we might have 8 or 10. And I, and I, you know, and I thought about that. It's got to be discouraging, but I tried to be encouraging him. And I said, but Bob, understand, anyone who lives in paradise must be happy all the time. <laughs> Somehow that didn't solve the issue. But nonetheless, Jesus has lost a number of people because they didn't know exactly what he was asking. A number of years ago, I was a part of a church uh, on staff, and I didn't know the aspects of the church other than connected with my part of the ministry, but I discovered that when someone came to the pastor and said, I wanted to join the church, it was almost immediate. And then later, when they realized that the church had these series of standards and do's and don'ts, they left. And the complaint was, you should have told those to us up front. And to be truthful, you should. Don't ever join a church until you get every question answered and never hesitate to ask questions, even if you've gone into the process of membership. It should be, as believers, an approach to be as open as we can with money, uh, with our plans. Uh, every one of those who are members, uh, and some who are not, are part of a, a flock list where a deacon is overseeing, in a sense, and you could go to them and say, talk to them about the church or have a question, and they'll bring it to the board. So Jesus, the problem is he had deeply angered the religious leaders. He wasn't in it to please somebody, anyone in particular. Now he's left Jerusalem, and he's continuing to minister in Galilee, and he would do that up until the annual Feast of Tabernacles. The event was considered one of the happiest of all Jewish celebrations. He knew the opposition, and they, they, were, they hated him. They were waiting for him in Jerusalem. The Feast of Tabernacles, by the way, would begin in the the Jewish month corresponding to our September, October. It's difficult to correlate Jewish holidays and that months with ours because they use a lunar calendar. We use a solar calendar. So the first day of their month coincides with a new moon. And uh, so this feast was a kind of harvest or Thanksgiving festival. It was midway between the Passovers. And many, many people would flock to Jerusalem for the feast. They built temporary shelters, which is the idea of the Feast of Booms, or Feast of Shelter. Um, and all around the walls of the city, you'd see these shelters. Uh, I can imagine along the main roads as they gathered and came into Jerusalem, stripping any tree or bush that was along the route in order to use in their symbolic picture of their wandering. And so they came prepared for a great deal of enjoyment and fellowship. And along with the Passover and Pentecost, this is one of the three pilgrims in the Hebrew religious calendar. It was mandated. And I want you to know that we, we finished chapter 6. We now start chapter 7. Six months have gone by. And absolutely nothing is said in the book of John, the Gospel of John, as to what happened in that half a year. We have no idea from John's letter. He had fed 5,000. He had declared he was the bread of life. There's little doubt that his fame was spreading. And here's where today's message begins. So much had he increased in recognition that his brothers were determined to offer him advice. 
nothing like some measure of success in your life or some path you're taking to bring out all of the advice from aunts and uncles and grandparents and moms and dads and brothers and sisters and whomever else. And we find there in verses 3 through 5, he said, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So what the brothers are saying, you know what, you can't be cooped up around here. You want to make yourself known. You want to publicize. You want to do this or that. And therefore, you're going to have to take the step. And consequently, as chapter 7 begins, it begins with tension between Jesus and his what would be regarded as his uh, half-brothers or step-brothers. But the brothers were condescending in their comments. They thought they knew better than Jesus Christ. It has never ceased to amaze me through the years of ministry and even years as a student in graduate school, uh, even in college, how many times, for example, freshmen offered advice the teacher. Someone who has just started graduate study wants to offer advice to the tenured, tenured chairman of that particular study. Or how many have never really been into politics and we know better how to run the government? And by the way, we may think we know better. You and I should rejoice and pray that we don't have all the headaches and heartaches that come with that kind of a leadership position. Whatever your views are, and so they were condescending. They believed that now Jesus was wasting his time. From their point of view, here he is languishing in the backwoods of Galilee. Nobody's going to recognize you here. Got to go someplace where they're going to see you. You're squandering your time. All you're doing is healing travelers and peasants. That ought to go over well. Uh, I, I would imagine if I studied the Greek a little bit, I probably that word translates also as deplorables, but I can't prove it. <laughs> so Jerusalem was where the action was. Jerusalem was where the people lived. The people that is, it really mattered. Jesus should go to the capital, and there he could build a real following, a following with influence. Years ago, I served with a pastor one Sunday, and, and uh, you know. And to me, it was a decent-sized church. They were running at the time about 400 or 50. Uh, in his heydays, they were 750. But the, and for their size and what they were doing, things were getting a little tight. But it, he said, you know, this is what we need to be praying for. We need to pray that God would help us lead to the salvation of some doctors and lawyers so our offerings would go up. Now, I was astonished. Folks, don't ever pray that someone gets saved for their money. People get saved because they're going to hell. People get saved because they need to be right for God. But what it's saying is, well, I've got to find some people to provide for God's house. Because evidently God can't do it. I, I believe that if God isn't doing it, we're not meant to have. God provides. I believe that. Amen. But he can build a following there. And after all, he can only improve from that handful of assorted Galileans, most of them are fishermen. You know, there's little education amongst them, not a lot of pizzazz or polish. You need to go where you can get that. And Jesus, the big advice is you need, it was what you need is more publicity. You need to find a publicity agent, someone who's going to promote you and elevate you. And if you got enough money on hand, we can hire programmers that will get you more hits on your program than you could imagine. So to the brothers, it was foolish to hide from the public eye. If he needed to do so, what he needed to do was step boldly on the center stage in Jerusalem. And I, I have, at least on mine, the word if is emboldened. If, if Jesus was the Messiah. The thing to do was to strike fire into the dry timber of national revolt. He could fan the flames, spread the firestorm throughout the nation. That was the way a Messiah should act. Now, what it's telling us is 
They're no different than the other people were. They wanted Messiah who was going to give them a national uh, leadership and an opportunity to take back the country. But to the brothers, Jesus would never get anywhere running timidly from place to place in Galilee. And in any case, Jerusalem was the place, and it must be there that Jesus is to proclaim himself to be the Messiah. Not in Cana, not in Capernaum, not in Nazareth, not in Nain. And then we find Jesus adding this comment. For even his brothers did not believe in him. And as long as an individual who has never trusted Jesus Christ, who has never became aware of God's word, the advice you will get from them will be minimal, if anything, at best. Believers grow stronger, they grow deeper, they grow more capable through the word of God, through their own the devotional life, and the fellowship of like-minded believers. Here were people offering Jesus advice that didn't believe him. They didn't believe who he was. They grew up with him. And it's incredible that these brothers had to live in the same Nazareth home for all of those years. And yet they failed to see who he was. And he, he you know, for, to them he was nothing more than an ordinary human being. The author of Hebrews writes that Jesus was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens. Now, I want to add this intersecting comment. Why didn't they know who Jesus was? Because their eyes had to know. They didn't see. Mary knew. I'm sure Joseph certainly knew before his passing. But you see, his brothers at that point in time didn't see because they were dead in trespasses and sin. You know, you may have family members who don't see Jesus Christ as God, who don't see him as the only means of salvation. You may have neighbors or others, and they don't understand why you bother going to church, why in the world you would give money regularly to a church, why you would pray so much. They don't understand because they are dead in trespasses and sin. So we don't reject them, deny them, criticize them for being blind or stupid. We pray that God would use our life, our testimony, our words, our conduct as a conduit for the Holy Spirit to work. Jesus was good. He was good beyond all the goodness known to the children of Adam. No one can fully comprehend the depth of goodness in Jesus Christ. He was loving, he was kind, he was patient, he was pure, he was wise, and capable beyond all others. As a mere young man, perhaps 13, 12, 13 years of age, he stood on the, the sacred steps of the temple and confounded the learned scholars. They were astonished. You know, sometimes, you know, I wonder if anybody kept track of that young boy's life. You know, people do that once in a while. There's a teenager in the youth group. And they, you know, I think he'd make a good preacher. He's a good servant of God. Don't tell him that. You'll scare him to death. <laughs> and they might even say when you're 20, 25, 30, 35, you know, I think you should be a pastor. Only to hear me say, that's a dream. And then somehow, 43 years of age, I get ordained, and within a short time, I'm here. So I haven't left my I said, go on crazy for the rest of you. Because being a Christian is serving and seeking to honor God. As far as the world is concerned, it's an unfathomable aspect of badness. They're crazy. But so here we have the brothers, and they didn't understand him, they didn't recognize him, and consequently it's a remarkable tribute to the genuineness 
of his perfect humanity. He was so clearly human, that's what they saw. And that's an important doctrinal concept. Jesus Christ was not 50-50. He was 100% God, 100% man, which is a mathematical impossibility, but it is a divine reality. By the way, the same thing is true in a marriage relationship. It's not 50-50. You don't come to halfway through the day and say, well, you used up your 50%. Too bad, now I'm going to do my 50 You give yourself. It's 100%, 100%. You never stop being a husband, even if your wife stops being a wife. Your wife, you never stop being a wife, even though your husband may stop being a husband. Because that's what you've taken the vow to do, and that's what God has called you to do. And that's what God has called you and I as believers. It's very easy to become intimidated. And we may have suffered from that through the years, some of us, and the work for us. You know, you don't want them to really know that you are a, a, a strong, born-again believer. Because you don't want to be humiliated. You don't want to be passed over for promotion or a job raise. Or you don't want to be stuck on a dead-end path because you're a Christian. And by the way, if you're too much of a Christian, you make people uncomfortable. And if I might add further, you and I have been given two things that we're to be as Christians. The first thing, we're to be as salt. And the thing you need to remember is salt is not supposed to overpower. I used to do this when I was a youth pastor. We'd say, oh, we're going to have some celery. You like it with salt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would take the celery stalk and get a wine and fill it with salt. Nobody was a taker on that. <laughs> Why not? Because too much salt is not good for you. It's not healthy. So God is saying you and I are to be enough to lightly flavor the lives of those around us. But you see, we also carry the responsibility not only being salt, but light. That means the light is turned on and they got to see something. they got to see something in their life. They get a taste of our actions, but then they got to see us in action. See us in the times when we're not flavoring for perhaps even struggling to know that. But the brothers were blind. They couldn't see. Even his miracles didn't convince him. They don't know what his gift was, but boy, he had a gift we need to go to Jerusalem because I think we can market that skill. His teaching didn't stir them, nor did his character interest them. In fact, as I've said in the years, I can imagine having Jesus Christ as a, as a brother could have been quite disappointing. Come on, Jesus, we're going to skip school today. And you imagine the pressure put on the parents you come home, they look at Jesus and say, you know, did you guys go to school? Yeah, I went to school. You went. What about your brothers? No, they didn't go. They went to school. They loved it. Another Joseph in the making. By the way, they tried to kill Joseph, too. So all, all they could say was, if he was indeed the Messiah, he had a strange way of going about and claiming his kingdom. Why? Because he, they wanted him to be their definition of a Messiah. People, when they even make professions, they want Jesus to be their definition of the Messiah. We want God to be our definition of God. So they had a much better idea of how things should be done. And he admonished his brothers in uh, that passage in 7, 6. My time has not yet come, but your hour is already. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of its works and they are evil. You're going to go up to the feast. I'm not going up there yet, for my time has not come. We will see that phrase, my time has not come, several, several times. It's an important phrase. Sometimes we see Jesus telling a mirror, a person who's been miraculously impacted, don't tell them I did this. 
Sometimes he will say to them, no, 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 I can't do that because my time isn't here. You know that the plan, the purpose that was for Jesus comes when suddenly he says to them, my time has come. And the hour has come. But you see, Jesus knew that when the time had come, when the hour had come, he would be arrested, tried, and crucified. He's trying now to desperately work with a group of men who are having a pretty hard time understanding what Jesus stood for. And he knew far better than they did that the, of the spiritual climate in Jerusalem. And by the way, the world is always Jerusalem when it comes to a spiritual climate. It is not very strong. And generally, it's really weak, even in a city noted as being the home of their faith. So the hostile religious leaders of Jerusalem, they wanted to kill him. And the time worked according to a divine timetable, not theirs or his brothers. He was not going to be pressured by his unbelieving brothers to change that. And he rejected their kinship presumption to tell them what he ought to do. Few people, by the way, live in a moment-by-moment -moment awareness of God's leading in their lives. In all honesty, we get wrapped up in the job, we get involved in some project, we're doing something with the family or the kids, and we are not dwelling in a spiritual, unique, moment-by-moment -moment life with Jesus Christ. But in a way, if we are doing what Christ has taught us, to love your families, to care for one another, to uplift each other in faith, to seek out the Father in your daily dimensions, we are in a moment-by-moment -moment situation because we are doing what God has asked us to do. Certainly his brothers knew such walk with God. And he reminded them their time is always ready. What does that mean? It means that your time of knowing the Messiah can happen at any time. You can know the truth because your time for understanding is ongoing. And so it is you witness to a loved one. You witness to a family member, a neighbor. You say something on the job. And maybe nothing, and nothing, and nothing. And maybe a year, two years, five years go by, and maybe not even with you. But you discover that person is trusting Christ as their Savior. You see, it wasn't their time. Because God knows the very day that you and I will make our profession of faith. We cannot be saved before that, regardless of what some may think. If some individual in the most unusual, unheard of situation happens, and someone is saved out of that, that was God's time. Wasn't ours. Or it certainly wasn't a person I thought would ever be saved. But God knows. They came and went to dictate their own desires, and as a consequence, they're not living in harmony with them. If we think of our, our needs more than God's provisions and instructions, then we're not living in harmony with heaven. So it would make no difference if they went to Jerusalem today, tomorrow, next week. Their steps were not ordered by Jesus. They were governed by the world, by the world's principles, by the world's policies, by the world's priorities. The world couldn't hate the brothers because they were in fellowship with it. You see, there's one thing you understand that if you're of the world or you're of any political persuasion or you're of whatever you might favor, that if you openly say, well, I am this, I am that, but you do not practice it, you're not. I felt very prayed for a young woman. She had been parading and along. I didn't pray for the rally in the group she was with. But someone disagreed, some woman did have disagreed with them, and a group of them knocked her down and started kicking her and beating her up. And this protester stepped in, said, that's enough, that's enough. And they turned and knocked her down and started beating and kicking one of their own. Why would they do that? She's not one of our own. She was only a, a hidden, she was a closet sympathizer with the others. She was a secret enemy of us. Because we have a time and we're in a time 
But if you don't do exactly what we do and say, you're not among us. The world is like that. If you're determined to walk with Christ, I, the saddest stories I've heard are those who grow up in a youth group, a church youth group, and then tell you they were the loneliest people in the church. Because as they tried to honestly live for Christ, they were being repressed by the bulk of the kids in the youth group who didn't want to live for Christ. And consequently, they didn't have the friends that they should have had. They didn't have the source of comfort and provision that should have been there. You know, a youth group can be an insulator to the school you go to. It's a comfort of those who understand your desire to honor Christ. But if you try to be in fellowship with the world and you listen to aspects to them more than you do the things of God, then you will not be in understanding and fellowship with God. You see, Jesus understood the true nature of things. This world, its system is the enemy of God. It is the devil's lair for sinners. It is his lure for the saints. By the word that is used here in its many places in the New Testament, the world is simply a human life and a society that is opposed to God. They don't want God. Human life and society and science and politics, its economics and social system, philosophies, pleasures, religion, goals, the organizations are opposed to God. Someone says, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian and I believe in evolution. Well, in a sense, you don't. Or you really don't believe you're a Christian. You understand that humanism dictates evolution. Humanism dictates no miracles, no Bible, no God, no Jesus Christ, no chance of anything creative. It has to be random. It has to be, uh, you know, unplanned. No matter how impossible that may be, if you are a, a part of the world and you are then a, you are humanistic in your outlook, all of these other things come into play. You say you are a Christian, you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you are saying Jesus Christ is God. And the Bible says that. And the Bible says he is the creator. He has made us. He sustains us. Nothing is accidental. Nothing is by chance. And he cares for us. And he loves us. And he wants to be with us. And us with him. You understand the pathway you take. <clears throat> and you know the irony in studies have shown that both sides who are dedicated to their views do not like ones in the middle, because they view them as unstable. And yet how often do we try to be in the middle? By the way, as I mentioned before, I heard a long time ago that I saw this interesting. The only things you find in the middle of the road are yellow lines and dead things. <laughs> and that's something when you say, well, I'm kind of in the middle, be careful what you're saying. But you see, it's a different world to come, and that's what we as believers have. The world, the world prince is Satan. Its motivating factors are the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. John Phillips wrote, when we are tempted to compromise with the world, we need to remember that the hand that the world reaches out to us is the hand that shed the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't want us to walk with God. They don't want us to be close and determined in our faith. Because if we get too much like that, the world in its own way will kill us. Now, it may kill our reputation. It may destroy our lives. It may not take our physical life. But the world can make you all feel pretty bad. As for Jesus, he was in the world, but he was not of the world. He directed his brothers to attend the celebration. Go on ahead. You just go on ahead. His hesitation for a public attendance was motivated by the uh, feeding of the 5,000. If you remember when that took place, they wanted to make him king. They wanted to make him the Messiah. And for Jesus, if I go into Jerusalem now, there is always that ever-present 
possibility that the marching singing bands of Pilgrim might try again. They may try to make him king by force if he joined them. And they are exuberant in what he might be, but they are not realistic because the Romans would never tolerate it. And even though they had to get permission, the Roman acquiesced to his death. As we close the passage, what is there to learn? It's a message that Americans have not learned well. Too often we stand with Jesus' brothers offering advice. We somehow believe that God's people must use man's tactics to do the work. We've substituted faith in God with faith in man. We do not need God to succeed. We only need publicity and a willing banker. Consider these questions. Can publicity add numbers to the church? Yeah. Can finding the right people build a church? Well, it depends on who they are. Get a few lawyers and that. Can noticeable growth captivate the mind? Can programs thrill the emotions? Well, many would confidently say yes to each of these, but the real question is, can any of these save a soul? Can any of these so strike us that we are drawn to the foot of the cross and the need to repent of our sins? You know, we can look at all of these, and there are many unsaved people who are kind and loving and faithful and generous and responsible. And they have strong marriages and good families, but they're not saved. And there are many who profess to be saved that don't have any of those qualities. But you see, that's another matter, another story, so to speak. Because we're not growing in our faith. Jesus remains for a while in Galilee. He lets the brothers go off. I can imagine that he, you know, he's thinking, oh, if I go up with him ever all along the way, hey, this is the one who fed 5,000. This is the one who did this and that. But when his brothers had gone up, he then went up to the feast, not openly, but in secret. And Jesus went into Jerusalem. By the way, in John 2.13, he came as a prince. They wanted to elevate him to leadership. And he was there to cleanse the house of God. And all, anytime you can reform anything, there are people going to support you. He would forcibly demonstrate his messianic zeal that day. When he went up in John chapter 5, he was a pilgrim. He was there, in a sense, in a new, new land. This time he's going to go up as a prophet. Going to make an important declaration to all the hearts. Jesus knew he would eventually appear in the temple. It was foretold by the Old Testament prophet Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way for me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Well, the messenger did come. It was John the Baptist. But then the part of the prophecy goes on, and then it says, and this messenger will prepare the way for and the things that I will do. So if we learn nothing else today, please remember this. God has a better plan. It is God's timetable we live by, not ours. It is God's work we do, hopefully God's way, and it will receive God's blessing. In Thessalonians, Paul says, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but who test God, who tests our heart. So we will, next week, next week, uh, look at who was right. The brothers or Jesus. And the week after that's coming in. Let's close. Again, Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the day you've given us. Help us to grow strong in your word. And Father, the only real answers we can give are the ones you give us to that can come from the scriptures. Help us not to become too confident in our own ways of thinking, answering God's questions through man's mind. It's a very trap that I see. So be with us today. Again, bless and provide in Christ's name.